What's up? It's Way Up with Angela Yee. I'm Angela Yee. And this woman sitting next to me is somebody who I aspire to follow in her footsteps. Kim Carter is here with me today. Um, Kim Carter, it's such a pleasure to meet you in person because I know we've had a Zoom before. We've met, you know, that way we have people in common. But um, I just want to introduce you and just we were having a lot of conversations behind the scenes, but I want to make sure we bring that. Uh, to our listeners on Way Up, our Way Up family. So Yes, and since we've talked, I've also got married, so now I'm Kim Carter slash Tillman. Hold on, <laughs> let me let me change this on the nose. Kim Carter Dash slash Tillman. Tillman. That's right. Okay. I who got is, a man. Who is, who is this guy? What, uh, no, first, let's talk about you, and then we'll, then Tillman, yeah, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Tillman, we'll talk <laughs> about him in a second. Uh, but Kim Carter, you have such an extraordinary story. And so I just want, for people who maybe have never heard of the Time for Change Foundation or your story, which also, by the way, was told, um, Tell It Like a Woman, Taraji P. Henson directed and Jennifer Hudson played you in this short film, which I feel like is going to turn into a full feature film. But just talk a little bit about your history of who Kim Carter is. Okay, so um, I would just say that I am the little light in the dark that refused to just fade out so the little injury that could based on my past experiences of incarceration molestation and all the trauma that went with the Rockefeller drug laws I could have easily you know um, committed suicide I could have easily succumbed to my condition but that little girl inside of me she wanted to win and even though she had been silenced at five years old because of that molestation, she still wanted to way out. So when I look at way up, I think about the way out. And Harriet Tubman, when she came to free the slave, she said, hey, I found the way out. So that little girl found a way out of that anguish and that, those feelings that kept her suppressed. And she wanted to come out and do what she can do. And I didn't know she was going to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> Kim, now, where, where did you grow up? Well, I, I was born here in New York, Brooklyn, New York. I was born in Kings County Hospital. And mm -hmm. I grew up between Los Angeles and Inglewood. My mother kidnapped me from New York when I was five, so I don't really got that New York swing in my conversation. But I was kidnapped and taken to uh, California where I succumbed to all the ills of societal oppression. So what what is it that your mom was doing in California when you she moved She was trying to find herself, uh, you know, stuck on her men and basically we was trying to figure out how to survive we was in extreme poverty we went to school to eat you know learning was secondary and she just didn't have what she needed to take care of four grown kids mm. but there were some things during that time like you said you went to school to eat that you did learn that maybe at the time you didn't even realize was uh was something that you'll be able to use later in life well, I just learned that um, it was going to depend on me, that no one was coming for me. My real dad wasn't coming for me. No one was coming for me. So I had to do for myself. So I learned that I can. I learned that I could do for myself. And so at the age of 17, right, is that the first time you tried crack cocaine? Yes, um, I introduced to crack cocaine in the house with my mom, and um, I became hooked. I became hooked. So between, um, you know, before that time, what was life like for you before that first time you tried crack cocaine? Being what promiscuous, was like? you know, mm -hmm. smoking weed, uh, in and out of different high schools, gang banging, just a part of the environment. No plans for the future, no mentorship, no leadership, no examples of what life could be like. And so when crack cocaine uh, hit the scenes, because you know it was brought in by the good federal government mm -hmm. and was saturated into our communities, and when I became hooked on crack cocaine, it filled this void that um, needed to be silenced. And that was the void that I wasn't good enough, the voice that, you know, my real parents never wanted me, my dad, like, all that stuff that I was feeling. When I hit crack cocaine, I became somebody. And all of a sudden, you know, I could talk and I can hold my head up. And then the addiction took over. And with the addiction comes the deprivation of eating and bathing and self-respect and self-esteem. I would no longer enjoy barbecues, movies, and concerts. Those was all gone. And I would be hooked on crack cocaine until I would be rescued by going to jail. Man, this is amazing because looking at you today, nobody would know that those were the things that you went through when you were younger. And I, I know that you've said that even with the crack cocaine, you would be that person in garbage bags layered on and just sitting at the bus stop. Exactly. So I never underestimate mm -hmm. the person that's laying on the side. And that's what I always say. You never know 
of the story that person has or where they're going to go because today I'm a boss, right? <laughs> and so you would think that um, people who didn't want to hire me when I came out of prison, people who didn't think I had a second chance because I had been in prison, wanted to keep using my past as to take it to my future. But see, God helped my future in his hands. I just need to look to the hills, and hence my help was coming. So I've been able to forge through that. But what happens is I see my sisters along the way. I've never lost sight of my sisters on the ground. I've never lost sight of that hunger in my belly when I don't have no food. And so I'm one that could be in a restaurant and look outside and see a girl on the bus stop and know she's not waiting on the bus. And I know to get out there and go get her a hotel room and mm. help her get some help because I sense that. Oh, my gosh. All right, so the first time you went to jail, how old were you the first time that you ended up? Oh, I've been going to jail since, like, 18, since 19 18? years old. Okay. It's revolving in that between the county jail and the penitentiary. The penitentiary is where things really got real. Mm hmm because then I was surrounded by all types of other criminal activity. Now, remember, I was just smoking a little crack, stealing from the local stores and all that. Right. I wasn't around, you know, people who uh, committed murder. I wasn't around people who committed um, credit card forgery, any of that. I hadn't learned any of that stuff, right? So when you go to the penitentiary, we all come together. And when we came together, we wasn't able to talk about the pains and the sufferings because there was no therapeutic services in there. But eventually, we came together and realized we all didn't have our fathers growing up. Mm -hmm. We all got kids out there in the system. We all have been molested by the time we was five, six years. We had so much similarity. It was like, look, we got to talk to one another. Right. We got to come up with our solutions. Like, there's something about us, not just the fact that we're black and brown from disadvantaged communities, but there's some pain and suffering that we share. And we have to work through that trauma and triumph. And so it was in the coming together that we was able to start healing and taking care of one another and really empathizing with one another that we had similar paths. So this was an impromptu coming together. This wasn't anything that was like, okay, now we got to make sure we all have conversations this was something you guys did in the penitentiary did for yourselves exactly exactly because we started realizing that we needed one another to survive to survive that belly of that beast we needed one another and together we were stronger and at some point you had a daughter I had a daughter. At 21. I had a daughter at 21. And um, to the best of my ability, I wanted to raise my daughter, but I couldn't put two and two together. I didn't have no support, no help, or no nothing. And so she was allowed to be raised by her father at that time, who wasn't really her father, but the guy that I was with, his mother and his sisters helped raise her. And then I went to the penitentiary. And then when he got ready to die, he gave it back to my mom. So then my mom had her. Mm -hmm. So fortunately for me, she didn't go into like the yeah, system, that's a system. That's a blessing that there was a male figure that stepped up to the plate yes. because it wasn't even her biological father. Mm -hmm. Where was he? He just. Yeah, it was. He was unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay. Unknown. unknown. Mm -hmm. All right. And so then somebody stepped up and his family stepped up to the plate. That's right. amazing right. because that's a rare thing. I feel like that you well, don't hear I about feel it. Like it was a God's gift. I feel like it was God's gift to my daughter you know, it was her. It was a gift to her. It had nothing to do with me. It was God's blessing. So, so she never had to go without go get molested. She never had to be surrounded by the drugs and the alcohol that I would have been surrounding her with if she had stayed in my custody. She never had to be harmed. She never had to go through none of that kind of stuff. So that's a blessing in itself. And you know, today my daughter's what well, she's an MBA graduate. You know, whoop, whoop. living her best life with my, <laughs> with my beautiful grandkids. Shout out to Zayden and Emery. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> And how did you repair your relationship with her? What was that like for you? Because, like you said, you know, you weren't able to really be there when she exactly. was younger. And I'm well, sure a lot of guilt came with that. Well, it was a lot of guilt. But once I started healing myself and getting therapy, I realized I did the best I could with what I had. I also realized my mom did the best she could with what she mm. had. And I started seeing how the generational curses was passed down and how when you don't have what you need for support, it's just like saying we could sit there and say, oh, there goes Shaniqua. Uh, her kids is all running around, but Shanika working three jobs to put food on the table, mm -hmm. right? But if Shanika was to not work, like, oh, she late, she could be working. Like, either way I go, we're not right. supporting. She got three kids, and that's what needs to happen. We're to support for us as a family, as a village, and we got to come back together as a people. So in my particular story, I was blessed in that way, but then I learned I had to create the village that I needed. So when I got clean and sober, I hung around people who was clean and sober. 
Has it been 30 years? 30, yep. 30, 30 years. years. That is huge. Congratulations. One day at a time. One day at a time. 30 and years. And walking around New York ain't no joke. Oh Everybody running around here smoking weed. I'm like, hey, <laughs> hey, what about the rest of us? You know Isn't that crazy to see that people could just walk around freely and smoke weed? A now? man is handing me a flyer with a joint in his hand. Like, I don't think so. You could walk into a store. You're like, I don't, and just I think buy. they're giving away for free out there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Everybody's smoking. Yeah, times have uh, definitely changed a whole lot. Now, talk to me about when you find finally were able to break the cycle. Okay, so I would say my first time breaking the cycle was the part that is depicted in the movie when I was um, going through another one of those cycles of prison and I was offered some therapeutic services. And so here is a recipe for success that's already been developed, but it's been used for people who had privilege and access. So here I am, low income black woman, never having privilege and access, so I never got therapy. I never got a chance mm -hmm. to process the stuff that was happening from me being a molested, from me being, you know, raped, from me being homeless, from me being in all those horrific experiences. I had to just carry that. So in this program called Forever Free, I was offered some services and I was rebelling. I was pushing away. I don't want it. It's not going to work for me because in my mind, I don't feel there's a way out. Right. But they started breaking the layers and like an onion is peeling them back and peeling them back and helping me to see I was not what had happened to me. Most important thing, I was not what had happened to mm -hmm. me. And when I was able to separate what had happened to me from me, mm -hmm. I could see me for who I was. That little girl inside, she can get what she needed. She needed some hugs. She needed some love. She needed to know okay. it didn't matter who her father was, that God was her father. She needed that. Ooh, and, you know, the, the sad thing about it is that it was a lottery. And so everybody couldn't get in that program. But there were so many women around you that needed it. But it just wasn't enough resources for everybody to be able to have that because, you know, crack cocaine, it's like an addiction, a sickness that you have. But instead of getting treated for that, you're in jail in exactly. the penitentiary. So it's, it's ironic. Society's response to my addiction was more prison. Society's response to this fentanyl overdose is more centers and more facilities. And I'm not saying I wouldn't want to see it that way. I'm just saying I know what we can do better. Mm -hmm. We can always do better. So we need to push forward policies and programs that actually support people and uplift them instead of putting these uh, oppressive conditions on people. You're treating a condition with a penitentiary. That makes no sense. Right. No, you're absolutely that makes, correct. That makes no sense. You're spending $75,000 a year for me to be locked up. When I come out, you want to give me two hundred. Mm -hmm. No, I can't even get into a program nowhere. Like, come on. And the importance of being reunited with um, your daughter, too. That exactly. meant a lot for you. Can you talk to me about when that was able to happen? Okay, so she was 13 when I got her back. And I had been um, through the drug program. You know, I had a couple of bouts with cancer, was given 90 days to live. God was like, I'm not through with you. Ooh. So I had went through those medical conditions. And then I had got my first apartment and I had got it furnished where, you know, people gave me furniture. I had it all fixed up. And then I wanted to get my daughter back. But see, I had this mother that would constantly try to tell me how I wasn't ready. I wasn't good enough. So that's part of that. Some of them issues. Right. Well, I was always never good enough. And so I was like, why don't you just wait until this? Why don't you just wait until this? But I want my daughter back. And I realized there was never going to be a day and a time that I was going to be good enough for you to get my daughter back. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get my, my daughter back now. So I got her back. So instead of them, my village, yay, you get your daughter back. They cried. So she came with me like like, like <laughs> it was morning. They was crying. Oh I was looking at the suitcase. You know what I'm saying? But for real, for real, what she didn't know is that I was getting her out of that cycle that she might have been caught up in right, by staying in that nucleus. And I was giving her a chance to break free and be able to send her off, the first one in our family, to go to college, mm. to get her degree, and then go on to Georgetown and get her MBA. First one that was offered all these amazing jobs when she got out of college because of her education and how smart she is. See, that wasn't happening from that nucleus. That right. happened from this rebirth that we got sitting in front of you right now. I put that seed in motion because I gave her a way out because I have found the way out. You know, you really are here for a purpose. When people can hear your story of so many different things that happened and the fact that you're here and helping other people is absolutely amazing. There's so many times that you really could have died, honestly. No, and, seriously. And not, and not been here. And not just from the drugs, but also from the cancer. Oh, my God. Also from, from being on the street. 
and this uh, the people that you encounter uh, mm-hmm. from being shot at. Exactly. And so when those prayers go up to God, God, give me one more chance. See, when he gave me that one more chance, I, I, I don't have it in me to not stay on God's path because I know what I do with me by myself. I, can, I will never be absent of God again in my life. I'm a zero. He's the one. In front of me, I make a 10. I'm not going without God. <laughs> no, seriously. Right. I'm not going without God. I have a addiction that is one day at a time. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I need to be with God on a regular basis. How did the relationship with your own mother uh, change throughout the course of this? Well, I would say that it has gotten to where I have healthy boundaries. <laughs> That's what it right, is. I, yes. have, I have healthy boundaries. I'm no longer a martyr. I'm no longer sacrificing myself for the sake of the whole of that clan. That's not my story no more. I'm standing firm in my own brand of dignity. And uh, I love my mother and I go see about mm-hmm. her. I take care of her financially to the best of my ability. But I am not a victimized by my mother. And and I do not tolerate anything that make me feel good. I don't do it. So if I need a one month break from you because you said something that's back in that old stuff, I'm gonna give you that one month. If I need two weeks and all that, but I, you have to teach people how to treat you. So I taught them how to treat me. I taught them to send me out to rob, send me out to steal, and bring stuff back in. I taught them that. I taught them that when I go to jail, I will go with a prison. I will sell drugs and send you money out. I taught them that. Mm-hmm. So I have to reteach them who I was. And now they know I come from a family of no, I ain't got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I ain't got it. And I'm, it's all the times that you say yes. The one time you say no. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's Saturday. You the devil. But hold up. <laughs> but, but, but it's okay. Let me be the devil devil for the whole seven days. You see what I'm saying? Right. Because I will not go back to zero again. When I had that cancer, I needed $5,000 to pay the co-payment for the health insurance company to get my cancer removed from me. And I looked around that nucleus, and they couldn't come up with $500. Mm-mm. And here I was dying. And this is where my real dad, shout out to my real dad, came through, and he brought me $5,000. Wow. You see what I'm saying? To pay for that surgery that I had that removed that cancer and started my chemo and my radiation. But I looked around and realized that these people is broke. And we come from looking good on the outside and I had nothing on the inside. You know, I just start getting real Louis Vuitton and real Chanel bags till last year at 59. Okay. I had my money in the bag, not on the bag. But now that I'm on this side of 60, <laughs> give me that bag. And I'm going to enjoy the rest of my life. You know what I'm saying? But I, before that, no, 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 no. It was the inside. It was building up those insurances, building up those savings, having that home ownership. I'm trying to figure out how my granddaughter's first and second kid can yes. have something from grandma. I'm going to leave a legacy. I want to leave more than just this book, Waking Up to My Purpose. I want to leave some funds in accounts with names on it. And not only do you want to do that, you want, want to educate other other people on how they're going to be able to do that, too. Exactly. So let's talk about the nonprofit that you have. Because the reason you're in New York, am I allowed to say this? You're yes. the winner of three Anthem Awards. Three times. Anthony, one of them shout out to my publicist uh, <laughs> who actually made it happen and nominated <laughs> us. You know, I promote you, agency Adrian. She's one of the best. <laughs> well, anyway, um, we was we was nominated and we received the gold in the humanitarian category, business of the year category, and community outreach category. And I will tell you that having the opportunity to come to New York and to share the love of what we do and why we do it and why we've been successful. So since 2002, Time for Change Foundation has supported over 3,500 women from incarceration and homelessness into self-sufficiency. We pride ourselves on saying we don't recycle homelessness, we end it. And one of the pivotal pieces for me is that I learned that the housing that the women needed after the shelter program was not there. So I started building my own affordable housing. We found out that women who had children in foster care was having their parental rights severed because they could not A access housing. housing. Mm-hmm. So since our inception, we've helped over 317 children from foster care reunite back with their moms. And so that's what keeps me going in the morning. And now that this whole reckoning with George Floyd and I was locked in my house like everybody else for two years because of the COVID, God gave me the vision to create our own Black Wall Street. I'm like, what do you mean, Lord? Am I, we're going to be a bank? He's like, create access to capital for black and brown women. 
I'm like, well, okay, well, I'm, I'm hearing you, but mm-hmm. how am I going to be the broker, the holding, the hold the LLC? <laughs> like, tell me how it's going to happen. Right after that, I get donated a piece of property that we built, uh, 10,000 square feet, a high-tech, state-of-the-art entrepreneur center for black and brown women. I raised $7 million to go in there and, and lay it out. It has everything that women need, all the 14 offices, three conference rooms, a cafeteria, a huge cafeteria, and a child care center. It's beautiful. It has pictures of, you know, um, on the windows, there's Oprah Winfrey, there's uh, Dolores mm-hmm. Huerta. And I want the black and brown women to know that we come from greatness and we come from power. And then we went about raising capital so that we can actually invest in those women businesses. I didn't know that less than 1% of all the venture capitalist funds oh. go to black women of color. Oh, I, I definitely know that. <laughs> yeah, see, I, did, I, I didn't definitely know, know because that. I never tried to access funds mm-hmm. on that level, right? But now God put me in position to actually be the vessel so the women can have access. Since we've opened on March 15th, we've only been open like nine months, we've been able to put $170,000 into the hands of black and brown women, 5000 7000 3000 3000 see capital money into those startup businesses. And it's just amazing. And we just got to start it. We've already been in Forrest Magazine. Shout out again to Angela, <laughs> up to Adrian over here on the right hey. hand side. We've been in Forrest Magazine. I see Magazine. it outside too, you know, all the when time. I see... <laughs> When I saw us in Forbes magazine, I said, okay, Lord, we're going to NASDAQ. We're going to the stock exchange. We're going to ring that bell. So this is what's happening. This is creating access. We have to create the awareness that investing in women of color, investing in these businesses as startup is the way of the future. Create our own job. I'm an employer. I usually couldn't even get a job. Now I'm, employ- I'm managing a multi-million dollar um, Amazing. projects. I mean, I'm building. I never went to school for building, but I'm building affordable housing and commercial real estate. That's what I can do. I know. And we've been, and that is part of the reason why we've been having conversations also. And I do want to say along with the fact that less than 1% of black women get access to venture capital funding, we also start businesses at a higher rate than any other group of people. So the fact that we have all these businesses, but we're not getting access to capital means we're not able to scale the way that other businesses are, are able to. A lot of times we're bootstrapped you know, we're using crowdfunding. We're divesting yeah. from our potential to build wealth. So if we're taking what we have, people who make money use OPP, other people's yep. profit, right? If we're using our own money, then we're taking from what we already have, which we already don't have enough. And so this is how we, we like call it hustling backwards, right? We need to build those line of credits and use those opportunities to take that money and invest that money into other opportunities to build. That's what we need to do. We need to be part of the OPP. When you realize that there's something that you need to do, like, for instance, opening up this um, this this hub that you've opened, the BPO, BBOP Center. Bebop. Well, the Bebop. Bebop. <laughs> Bebop Center. All right. Is there, like, seriously, is there, like, a voice that comes to you? Like, how does that come to you? That how do you know from, your calling? It, let me tell you it comes from God. It comes from God because I look, okay, well, where are we going with that? I'm not talking to him. Where are we going with that? Show me the way. Mm-hmm. My mind went to, we're going to be a bank. How else are we going to build, rebuild Black Wall Street? I'm watching the, the the reconciliation and the reckoning around, you know, this uh, police brutality and around this exacerbation of black and brown women being utilized during the COVID to hand out toilet paper and food to everybody else, putting our lives on the line just to serve other people who are going on vacation mm-hmm. in their homes in Europe and everywhere else to hide out from the disease. People are dying from this disease. It's impacting us. Our yeah. lives are on the line. And I saw this sister, and she's like, you want to know why we burning down these, these targets and these Walmarts because we don't own nothing. She said, doesn't it belong to I'm like, well, why don't we own? Because see, Time for Change Foundation, we have 19 locations and we own all our all of our locations. Yes. I never wanted to Commercial have a, real estate. Yeah, I never wanted to have a landlord come to me because of the city's pressure. She's housing those women from prison again or she's doing this, she's doing that. You know, I'm doing what I want to do. And how do I do that? You got to have positioning. So I, I never wanted to be in a position where they could uproot me. I want to be in a nice neighborhood. I want my kids to go to the best schools. Yeah, they're homeless kids, but guess what? They don't know they're homeless. That kind of in houses that look like me and you can go sit down in it. You don't even know you in a shelter. You know, let me ask you this, since you brought that up, right? Because, you know, we have the building in Midtown Detroit, um, and Topeka Sam is somebody who you're also friends with. Shout out, Topeka. <laughs> um, who's working with us on this. She's formerly incarcerated, and housing is one of the biggest issues for women when they come home to, like you said, be reunited with their families, to be able to have a place to bring their children and, and be comfortable enough to be able to go out there and work but people in the community can sometimes think oh we don't want those people here in our community because I noticed that 
you know, when we posted about it, and part of our mission is to make sure that women who are formerly incarcerated get housing. That's part of what we are doing with this building. Exactly. Um, but I did see some comments, oh, you're just going to ruin the neighborhood by bringing people like that here. I want to talk about that for a second and people's mentality when it comes to... Uh, you know, people scream out prison reform and they the talk NIMBYs, about the yeah. not in my backyard. Yeah. And I'll go back to this right here. How did you get a backyard? How did you get a backyard? You know, like sometimes um, when I first started years ago, uh, they had the same thing. The house that I started with was the house that I had my first house I ever bought. I bought it for ninety thousand dollars. And I used that house for my first shelter. But like, not here. Well, me and my husband at the time had been living in. We both came from prison. Matter of fact, y'all looking at us. We looking at y'all. Mm-hmm. We we got our doors locked because who is you? <laughs> no, for real. you don't, don't get it twisted, right? Right. And so, I'm scared of y'all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We we looking, y'all looking, right? You ain't speaking, and we ain't speaking. And we gonna keep it like that. So don't get all friendly now. This house turned into a shelter, but I had the right under federal law to open up my home to six women unrelated. And even though the city would try to create other ordinances, at the same time I was doing that, God was also shining a light. And I was getting awards like the Harriet Tubman Award. And I was getting these prestigious awards and I would be on stage getting the award. Like, I'm like, I'm like isn't it ironic I'm getting an award today for being a peacemaker, but yet and still the work that I do has now been deemed illegal by the city of San Bernardino. They just passed the ordinance in the middle of the night. Da, 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 da. So I wouldn't just be right. putting people on blast, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, everybody calm down. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I learned then that my voice matters. And so I started doing, you know, I would do the press conferences. I would hold the town halls. I would have the rallies. I would go to Philadelphia, Office of Inspector General. I would go to the accountability of the accountability agencies and start wrecking on people. I also became well-versed in what the law was. I became well-versed in housing regulations. I became well-versed in CDBG grants, ESG grants, HUD grants, all that. Because I want to make sure as I'm dealing with these systems that I'm not being treated unfairly, but I'm treated I'm being treated according to the policy procedure. Because you don't get to make it no laws on me. Right. And I have this thing in my system that I'm out here start raising up. I'd be like, don't say nothing. And it's like boom, boom, boom. And I'd be like, okay, here we go. Boom, boom, boom. And it's like brr. <laughs> and it just comes out. And that's what God wants you to hear. <laughs> so that's what you got. Well, that thing in your system. Let's talk about uh, you know, the um tell it like a woman, right? And that is uh Jennifer Hudson is actually Kim Carter in that movie. She plays you. Yes. And uh, it's called Pepsi and Kim, right? Okay, so here's the thing. So these are some of the pictures right here, mm-hmm. and it's also in your book. So can you imagine getting a call from Taraji P. Henson? Do you got a minute? Uh, uh, yeah, I got a minute. Uh, <laughs> Have a few. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I pull over the freeway. She goes, yeah, well, you know, I read the script that was done by Catherine Hardwick, the one who... You know, directed um, Mafia Mama and 13. She goes, and um, I just love it. You know, I've directed one of the episodes of Empire, but I really like to direct your story. I'm working with my team right now, and I just want to connect with you that you know I'm on fire for it. We're going to make this happen. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, can somebody believe that? I just got a call from Taraji B. Henson. <laughs> so then we went and had a Zoom, and she gets on the Zoom, and she's just so down to earth and just so real. And she's like, well, who do you want to play you? I was like, whoever, if Cookie can't come up, then whoever right, right. can come, Cookie. right? <laughs> and then the next time I got on the phone, she's like, you're going to like this. I'm like, at this point, I've already pinched myself enough. I can keep my smile down, and I can really kind of say, like, I got some sense. And so she said, you're going to like this. I was like, who is it? She said, hold on. She's coming on right now. And then here comes Jennifer Hudson swoops in. And I was like, oh, my God. You brought the demon to the screen. I, I was up out my seat in my living room at this point. I can't, I can't even down. imagine. You brought the demon. You brought the demon. And Jennifer, OMG, she is the sweetest soul. I mean, like on set, you know, some of the trauma she had to relive and where she went to in herself to bring that out, it was really like right in line with the true authentic feelings that I had when I went through that trauma. And this woman is so thoughtful that she would come to me. Are you okay? I'm like, uh, are you okay? She goes, yeah, I'm okay. I told them they could start paying me for every one of my tears. <laughs> <laughs> and we would just laugh it off, you know. She's brought me this big old bouquet of flowers. And they're like, that's for you. I'm like, that's for me? I'm like, who knows I'm here? Right. And they was like, baby, it's every, all about you. They said, everybody's here today because of you. Yeah, it's all about you. That's what they said, too. And she brought this 
big old, I mean, a huge bouquet of flowers. And it said, don't let other people's ugly ever mess up your beautiful because uh, your light needs to shine. Yeah, she did that. It just made me feel so, you know, it just made me feel so good. And so having the movie done, like I always pinch myself, but I go back to this. I don't get to be all high and mighty uh, because at the end of the day, I'm I'm one hit away without God. I'm... um. I could be disposed of. If I don't stay in alignment with God's purpose for my life, then what if you say, okay, well, I don't need you no more. If you ain't finna keep moving these mountains, do what I need you to do then. All right, homegirl, uh, check out if you want to because you remember you got all these other things that's waiting to jump on you like high blood pressure, sugar not be right. all the rest of that. You ain't got none of that because I cover you. So uh, jump out there if you want to and see what happens. So, you know, it, and I say that to say, of course I'm thrilled. Of course I pinch myself that there's a movie about me. I'm watching her play Aretha Franklin and watching her play me. I'm like, Lord, <laughs> you know, when I got that CNN Hero Award, it was 50,000 nominations in eight different countries, and I made it to the top ten. And I'm standing there on stage with people who go to war-torn countries and create orphanages. And I'm like, Lord, I never see myself making an impact that I do because I'm so busy doing the work. Right. But you see the women whose lives you have impacted. I saw when you were on Jennifer Hudson's show that uh, one of the women actually came on the show. She's a registered nurse. Yeah, she's a registered yeah. nurse. And now she's actually teaching at the same school to try to kick her out. Her name is Keisha Murphy. Shout out to Keisha. She's doing amazing. And she's and she's being that voice for other women. And because of Keisha, we actually was able to go to Sacramento and make a law so that that wouldn't happen to no other female being ejected from a school because of a felony conviction after you've already collected the tuition. She was $110,000 in debt Whoa. before they kicked her out of school because of felony conviction that she had 15 years ago. That's wild. But see, God, when she called me, God said, move on that. So I, I moved on that. And and what I did was I just started trying everything. Let's try to call the senators and congress people, let them all know. Let's try to get to the news and let them all know. Let's try to find mm -hmm. out the school's bylaws and let's figure out what we can find up in there. Let's go to some other schools try to get you. I, I just tried everything. And I didn't know she was sitting there like, oh, my God, what are we going to do next? Because <laughs> she was like, we was doing so much, right? I'm trying. I'm just trying everything. I don't have one strategy, but I know we got to do what we got to do. Gonna what you, said, gonna you said you went from breaking the law to from making breaking the law. law to Mega laws, mm -hmm. right? And so, and that's two statement. We changed the Welfare Reform Act. We've changed the Adoption Safe Family Act. We have worked on a lot of stuff with Prop 47, Prop 36, AB 109, like anything to do with prison reform. We're removing some of those oppressive Jim Crow type laws that would oppress people of color. We have been we're pulling up, pulling the onions back and unlanding and lifting up the voices of those most impacted. We truly believe the solution that we need is within us it's nowhere else and so when we come to the table we say there's no meeting about us without us and so i like to just give a shout out right now to vanessa perez she's running time for change foundation and young leadership hispanic woman and she is amazing and she gives me the ability to go out and do i, I didn't know i could raise seven million dollars since i want to go try it <laughs> but i wouldn't have did that behind a desk worrying about the next report and worrying about the next you grant. have to hit the road you have to hit the road and she allows me to be able to do that and without looking back because she got that you know what I'm saying? And God has built up her leadership to be able to run the organization. She's less than 40 years old. She's 33 now, but she's run a multi-million dollar organization, and she's doing it very, very well. The fact that we have a multi-million dollar organization, and just a shout out one more time, we are having our upcoming gala. Okay. It's going to be happening April the 19th, 2024 in San Bernardino. You can go to their website, www.time for change foundation, all spelled out. And we would love for people to come on and be a sponsor, you know, sponsor some of the women from the shelter to be able to attend. I mean, any way you can support uh, donated items for our silent auction. We would love to be able to, you know, offer somebody some Broadway tickets from New York or something to that. Oh, uh, we definitely yeah. got you. Woo! woo. Uh, trust me, okay. we're we gonna figure out some things that we can do to, to make sure we support Bebop. You heard and it Time right here Foundation. online. Wake up with the Angela Yee. Because <laughs> nothing for nothing, Kim Carter has already committed. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, to, definitely to outfitting. I think she said three of exactly. the units. Um, got you. And our building in in Detroit is going to be done at the end of March. But I also want to make sure that for some of the people that we are going to be. Um, you know, this building is for that they also do have resources that they may need because I think that's important too, you exactly. know, exactly. to make sure that we can help you have access to different resources because the truth is that sometimes this world can paralyze you into not acting at all. Fear. But yeah, the fear and also just feeling like it's just 
hopeless and there's nothing you can do. But the fact that you you were able to use that as a catalyst to really go forward and create uh, things that help other people. Also, like you said, create laws, change laws. All of those things I think are so important and so inspiring for everybody to be able to see because I think even now it's an election year and we look at how many people are like, I'm not voting for this person. This person didn't do anything for me. Well, what did you do? You know, exactly. and, and why are you waiting and on And you them? have the power to do things and you're living proof that we do have the power exactly. to make change happen. And it may not be overnight at all. You know, usually it isn't. But if you're not doing anything, then don't complain about what not, what's not getting done. Exactly. But my whole thing is that you can't look to other people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Look to the hills. Look to the God to give you the support. God gives me the messages. He gives me the vision and he gives me the provision. See, that's the point. He gives me the provision. I can't complain about that. Right. You know what I'm saying? He does, the work is not hard. It's like, are you courageous? Are you bold enough? Did, did you dare? Did you dare without your college degree go and try to actually build affordable housing? What do you know about plans? I know the plans the Lord had for my life. <laughs> How about that? For, for me to do well, for me to prosperous, and me to be able to help other people. I know that. That's all the plans I need to know. So that allowed me to build affordable housing. And then we went on and did the, the Bebop, B-B-O-P Center mm -hmm. dot C-O-M <laughs> dot com. You got to go to the Bebop Center. You got to recognize we got we got we got Harriet Tubman flowing through there, lifting up women, let them know that they can. We got we got so general truth letting you know that you come from greatness. I mean, we got um, Dolores Huerta on the windows. Like this is a place that is a cultural experience of um, progress that lets you know that you are the next millionaire. You are the next billionaire, and there's nothing to stopping us. Nothing stopping us, sis. Well, Kim, I want to close it out with the uh, thoughts on Mr. Tillman. Who is this man that you're married to now? I want you to know, God <laughs> is so good. <laughs> My man, my man, my man. <laughs> you know what? God sent me an angel. He sent me exactly what I need. During the COVID, I laid up in that apartment and while I was at in the Bay Area. I looked around at all them brand new clothes and shoes and stuff. I like the fact that you're moving and gyrating while you're talking about it. Uh, She's like... <laughs> yeah, I looked around and I asked, Lord, why have thou forsaken me? Because that... The mental health that I experienced of being isolated for so long with not surrounded with my family or friends because I had moved from Southern California to the Bay Area to expand our business. So I was only up there for one year, opened up the first home called Brighter Futures for Women, and then the COVID hit. So I wasn't even in a place I really wanted to live forever. That was just like temporary housing until I got ready to get to where I wanted to be. And I got stuck up in there, and I was like, why have God forsaken me? And God told me he's going to give me exactly what I needed. And I needed somebody to care for my soul. I didn't need another person coming to me with another business idea. I get nothing on my <laughs> own, right? I need somebody to say, did you drink your water, babe? Babe, here go your food. Babe, did you get your rest? Babe, your movie you wait, you want to watch this on. I needed somebody to care for me. And what I love about my husband is that he didn't even have the ability to learn how to Google me or any of that. So when he got with me, he loved me for my heart. He didn't have, he just had to come out of prison for a long time. So he didn't know how to research and, oh, she got it going on. He had, he was clueless to all of that. Mm -hmm. So here's a person who's authentic, who loves me for me. I love him. And even I was so hesitant about revealing my feelings because I felt like let this man finish re-entering society. He's he's doing great. Don't impose yourself. You know, don't. I felt like that, like I shouldn't. I talked to my pastor, my sponsor, like, you know, I'm feeling some kind of way, but it's not lust. It's something else. I was feeling so much peace and calm from this man because I got the storm in here. Mm -hmm. And in his presence, I just feel like, <sighs> <laughs> no, you somebody can you can uh, you could allow somebody to take care of you because sometimes that's hard to do. They said that they said that I thought I was allowing people, but apparently I wasn't. Mm -hmm. But guess what? I allowed it. But I never would say nothing to him. But he looked up one day. He was putting um, some apple trees in the back of my yard, and he looked up and he said, "You know, nobody can't deny his connection." I was like, "Huh?" <laughs> <laughs> if you could hug, you could hear. Look, okay. look, I was like, I was like, huh? He said, you know, nobody can announce. I said, the connection to me, he said, man, you got. And seriously, 
me and this man connected like this on day one <laughs> with just childhood trauma experiences for just how he was treated by the system for pain and suffering and not never getting no healing. Just how he had been incarcerated, never had committed a violent crime in his life, but just society's way is we can't do anything with you. Bam. And they put him up in a cage. You are. And then to not have the family support that mm -hmm. we needed to lift us up. His family was still off on drugs and everything else. Nobody was there writing parole letters for him. He had no support but except for his mother. And my people wasn't doing, my people love to see me in prison. In prison, I send checks out. Right. So why would we want you out here where you're going to be smoking up everything? Like, you need to be in there where you can kick mm -hmm. in, right? So we had all this in common, and it, we just meld together, you know. And on my birthday, he got on his knees and asked me to marry him. And had a nice little ring, too. I was like, ooh, look at you. <laughs> Go on with your best self. You know, my mom was like, I hope he didn't spend all his savings. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I never want to see nobody go broke, you know. <laughs> Well, he did what he wanted to do. <laughs> okay. And then we got, we got married, and it's been wonderful. I was married now. Oh, uh, well, congratulations. Yeah, you sound to Mr. Tillman. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> all right, well, Kim Carter Tillman, uh, thank you so much for joining me today. I know that you and I are going to do a lot more together just because of how we connected. Yes. It wasn't under no apple tree or nothing, but <laughs> I, I definitely appreciate you and what you've done for so many other people, too, I think thank is you. important. And congratulations on, I know you don't do it at all for the accolades, but they are well-deserved. Thank you so much. You know, I just want to be here to help others. Like I say, I want to help you lift <clears> up these women. Like that's the cause that I can stand behind all day long, right? So we all it's it's enough room for all of us to do something. Yes. It's enough room for all we of us. We need. Yeah, we more. need because nobody has solved the whole issue yet. So like at the end of the day, there's still work to be done. And so I love being around empowering. So anytime you have anything, any kind of event, any type of speaking, like I'm a motivational speaker. Like I really can command the crowd. I have a lot of different skills I got by myself. So call me. This <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Kim Carter, thank Kim Carter Tillman. Thank you so much. Again, the book is Waking Up to My Purpose. Make sure you watch Tell It Like a Woman so you can actually see some of that story. But Waking Up to My Purpose, you can see the full story. And we are really petitioning for this full feature length film to get done and to all the women that you've helped you know I see them in the comments I see just uh, the actual living proof of that and I think that's important uh, the Bebop Center make sure y'all come out April 19th if there's any way you can support you know um, all that information is there yeah our annual gala is there and I also have my own website it's called kimschamp.com that's K-I-M-S is in Sam champ like the champion dot com and uh, check me out alright thank you so much <laughs> <laughs>